or short. And I'm so excited to spend this hour with you. Now there's a lot of material I wanna cover in the next hour. At the end of the webinar, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask a few questions that you might have along the way. So if you could just hold those questions to the end, and it could be that I answer your question as we're moving through the presentation. And you will get a link to this webinar uh, from Christy. You will have the opportunity to view this webinar again, which will come in handy because the material that we're going to cover is going to seem like it's a tremendous amount of information in a short period of time. And there could be some points where you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, but I assure you, you can do this. Now we only have about, as I said, 50 minutes, maybe 60 minutes together. Tax is a field for you to work in as an entire career. Tax is also a course that I teach over the course of 16 weeks. So needless to say, in an hour, we're really only going to cover yes. the surface of tax preparation. But I plan to cover some really important surface areas, including tax forms and actual tax calculations. So if you're thinking, wait a minute, I did not sign up for that. You can do this. Stay with me. Don't feel overwhelmed. I just want to let you know, I will actually show you some tax forms and we will do some calculations together. And I want to do that because I want you to be comfortable enough to do your own tax return if you so choose. So if you would like to do it utilizing the various softwares that are out there, that is fantastic. Or you join today's webinar just to further your understanding with regard to tax, but you're still going to have someone else prepare your tax return. That's totally fine. There's a lot of great people working in the world of tax and they have a passion for taxes. They have a passion for helping people. I just wanna be sure you're comfortable with all the underlying principles. I wouldn't want you to be overcharged for your tax preparation service, but if you want to continue to service and visit your local tax advisor, please feel free to do so. Now, before we begin, I wanted to cover just some general areas with regard to tax preparation. And I'm gonna point these out when we actually get to the tax forms. So the first one I have there is who must file. It's really based on the standard deduction. So for some of you, you might find that your income level, the amount that you earn for the year, is not large enough for you to even file a tax return. And you might be thinking, well, why should I bother to even file a tax return? Well, here's why. Maybe you don't have to file a tax return because you only earn six, seven, eight thousand dollars let's say, for the sake of conversation. But if you had some federal withholding taken out of your pay for the course of the year, you'd be able to get that back when you filed your tax return. Now, of course, if you had $100 coming back, you wouldn't want to pay someone $200 to prepare your tax return. But I just want to let you know that if that's the case and you're not required to file a tax return, you still can go ahead and file it so you're able to get that refund back. And towards the end of the presentation, I will let you know of a service that you can use for free to get your taxes done. I also want to talk about the filing status. Now, for Everyone on the line or filing status could be a little bit different. The filing status we're going to see on 1040 page one or at the very top. And the filing status is one of the very first things you need to decide on when you are completing your tax return in the software. So many of you might have used products that are available online. You create an account, enter your social security number, and you're asked for your filing status. If you're married on the last day of the year, your filing status is married filing jointly. You've got two individuals who are married, your filing status, married filing jointly. If you are a non-married person, your filing status is single. Now, you could be engaged, you could be ready to be married, but at the end of the year, the last day of the year, if you're not married, you're single for tax purposes. Between those two, there's a filing status called head of household. Head of household, the easiest way to remember it, is a single person, someone who's not married, but they have some dependents. They have some individuals they are taking care of. Taking care of, just generally speaking, means you're providing more than 50% of their support. So married filing jointly, single, and head of household, those are by far the three most common filing statuses. And for most of us, it's pretty easy to figure out which filing status applies to us. There's also two others worth mentioning, surviving spouse and married filing separately. A surviving spouse is when you have a married taxpayers. One of the taxpayers passed away for that year. During that year, they're still considered married filing jointly. For the following two years, their surviving spouse could choose the status of 
surviving spouse on the tax return. And that filing status puts you in a little bit better of a tax rate situation. Now, there are some requirements that need to be met with regard to that, like you need a dependent in the home. But in that situation, again, married couple, one of the spouses passes away, that remaining spouse in the year of death can file, married filing jointly, the following two years would be surviving spouse. And then married filing separately. I have that in red there. Many, many times taxpayers will come into our, our VITA office and I'll, I'll mention VITA at the end of our presentation. And they'll say, I wanna file separately from my, my spouse because that's what's best for us. Usually that's not what's best for you from a tax standpoint. If you have your own reasons as to why you do not wanna file a tax return with your spouse, that's not an issue, but it usually does not put you in the best tax situation. So married filing jointly is a better tax rate schedule for you to be in. It's just a common misunderstanding I find in the world of tax. Also on page one, there's gonna be a section for dependents. Dependents are really easy. Basically 16 years and younger, and then everyone else. The distinction between the two is pretty important because for 16 and younger, we get this thing called the child tax credit. It's worth $2,000. We actually get to reduce our tax by 2,000. We'll do a calculation in a little bit and I'll show you how that works. There's also an other credit, the other dependent credit that allows us to get a credit of 500. So you're a person who is single, but you've got someone living in your home. The person happens to be your child. You would be entitled to claim that person as your dependent and you'd get a child tax credit. Let's say that person's living in your home you're providing more than 50% of the support, the person's over the age of 16, you would still get an other dependent credit. And then last but not least here, parents claiming children. Another common misunderstanding is, well, I'm claiming my children, they work during the year, they shouldn't file their own tax return. The same is true as I mentioned when we first started. There are times when you might not be required to file a tax return, but it may be worth it for you you might get back $50, $100, maybe $200 based on what you paid in for the year. And again, as long as you're not going to prepare, that's going to charge you more than your refund amount, it may actually be worth it to you. So these items here, I'm not making light of them. They are important, but that's not where I wanna spend our time today with regard to tax preparation. I wanna spend our time talking about income items. Some of the income items we have might be additions to existing income. Some of them might be subtractions. I wanna talk about the standard or itemized deduction, which one you're going to choose. We'll actually do a tax calculation with regard to finding out the tax liability that you would show on your tax return. And then ultimately, what is your refund amount or any amount that you have due? Now the tax forms for those old enough to remember, there was about a 30 year span where the actual tax forms looked pretty similar. So from about 1986 to 2017, page one and page two of a 1040 tax form look really, really similar. And then suddenly in 2018, there was a substantial amount of tax law changes and the forms changed dramatically. And if you might remember from a few years ago, the form shrunk down. They were almost trying to achieve a postcard with regard to the size of the tax return. But I think they quickly realized it doesn't really matter the size of the tax return that's on the screen because almost all taxpayers now file the returns electronically. So how much paper you're actually using on the screen doesn't really matter as much. So what's been happening over the last two years is they're suddenly making changes, moving us back towards the forms as they were a few years back. And it reminds me of the more things change, the more things stay the same. So if you're looking at the form now thinking, wait a minute, it seems a little bit different than last year, a little bit different from a few years ago, that's the reason why. Here is page one and page two. And I warned you at the very beginning, I was gonna bring this up. I don't want you to look at these two pages and think that's it, I'm checking out of this webinar. I did not sign up for that. I want you to know that page one and page two of the 1040 is the same for all of us, everyone online here today that files a tax return this year, page one and page two is going to look the same for us. Now the boxes we utilize are going to be a little bit different. Maybe you'll have three or four boxes filled in. Someone else will have five. Just because we see all these boxes and all these spaces does not mean we're going to fill them up. We're only gonna fill them up with the tax information that you have for that given tax year. 
we first started talking about some kind of general overview items. I was mentioning filing status right at the very top of the tax form. That's where you choose your filing status. If you're doing it utilizing software, they would ask you maybe from a drop down or click a box with regard to your filing status. First name, last name, address, social security number. That's no big deal. You're gonna enter dependent information in here, similar to what we talked about just a moment ago, children 16 and under, and then anyone over 16 that you are taking care of. Notice here, there's two columns, child tax credit, credit for other dependent. Once you enter the information into your system, the software that you're using, and the software sees the date of birth of the individual, you'll automatically get a little checkbox either in the child tax credit or the credit for other dependents. And it's just based off of age. So the only thing you need to do when you're preparing your tax return is know the individuals who are your dependents. And once you enter them in the system, the system will automatically take the child tax credit or the other credit based on the person's age. Now, notice we're halfway through page one and all we've done is filing status, name, address, social security number, and dependent information. So one fourth of these two pages that may look overwhelming to you is nothing more than just sort of general information that none of us would have any problems completing. Now we start actually getting into some income items and some deduction items, and then ultimately the tax and then the refund amount that you might have coming or a balance due that you might owe. We're gonna start walking through some items that might fill in these boxes on your tax return. And I say might because again, your tax return could be different than the person next to you. Maybe you only have two boxes of income items on page one. Maybe you have seven or eight of them. You only need to be concerned about your tax documents for the year. And we'll talk about some of those specific documents. I also want to show you the tax rate tables. Now, if you're looking at that thinking, whoa, I did not sign up for a math class. A couple things to consider here. We only need to be concerned about the tax rate schedule that you are filing for. Your filing status. So if you are married filing jointly, we can ignore the single tax rate schedule. We can ignore the head of household tax rate schedule. We'll just focus on the married filing jointly tax rate schedule. So now we could ignore two thirds of what I've got on the page here. And now when you're just looking at your tax rate schedule, all you need to determine is, well, what's my taxable income? We'll actually walk through how to get to that number there. Once you have that number, you just go to this table, you look to see where that number falls in the table, and then we can quickly do the math here. Now, if you're thinking my software does all this for me, I don't need to know how to do any of this math. I don't want you to just know how to do a tax return. I want you to know why. I want you to know why the numbers are coming out on the forms. So that if you choose to take your information to a preparer, I don't want that for person to take advantage of you with regard to what they're charging you telling you that what they needed to do was some complex creation of tax forms and calculations because it truly is not. And I'm going to show you that here today. So the tax forms and the tax rate schedules is the most complex thing we'll look at today. And I will be bouncing around back and forth. That's the only way I can do that and show you what it is that we're gonna be talking about. But again, you do have the luxury to go back and watch the webinar again, if you wanted to slow it down and spend a little bit more time on each of the topics that we're going to cover here. So I mentioned on 1040 page one, most of it is sort of some general information and then lines one through seven are the most common income items most of us have. There's a reason why those are listed one through seven. Notice box one is wages. So for all of us who get a W-2 at the end of the year, those wage amounts are going to go in box one. So one through seven are the most common items. And it's no accident that number one is wages because most people get their earnings via a W-2 at the end of the year. Now those other items there in, in lines one through seven are what I have on the screen. And I'm gonna touch on these as we go through, but again, not all these may apply to you. For younger taxpayers, usually W-2s and interest and dividends, maybe some capital gains and losses, that's more likely what you're going to have. Older individuals, you'll have some retirement distributions or pensions or social security. You might find you have all seven of these. You might find you only have two of these. Again, we're gonna talk about these topics 
you only need to worry about for your tax preparation, the items that pertain to you. With regard to the W-2s, whether you have one W-2 or 10 W-2s, they all go on line one of 1040 page one. So if you as a single individual worked at 10 different employers throughout the course of the year, you would add up all of your wage totals and just put that on line one. Same is true if you were married and you and your spouse together had 20 different W-2s. You just add them all up and put that on line one. So all of your W-2 earnings go on line one. Now it is worth noting that if you earn income in multiple states, you'll have to file separate state tax returns. Our conversation today is federal income tax preparation, but I will tell you each state can have its own state tax return. So Illinois state tax return is different than an Indiana state tax return. Some states don't have any tax return that you need to complete, but it could be you worked in five different, five different states, you would need to complete five different state tax returns. And this is where the softwares I have found online tend to start to charge you quite a bit more when you start completing multiple states. And that's the reason why I'm not defending them. I'm just giving you a reason why is that every single state has its own tax return. That own tax return needs to be loaded into the software of that provider. And then it just gets rather expensive. So that's the reason. Interest income, interest income. These are dollars that you receive is mostly taxable. I could stop right there and move on, but I'll just add two more things is that municipal interest income is not taxable. So some of you may live in a town where they wanted to build a new library. And what they do is they issue some bonds. If you bought one of those bonds and you received interest along the way, that's not gonna be taxable. And the reason why the IRS makes those non-taxable, it makes that a very enticing investment for someone to say, I can help out my village and I can receive some interest income that's not taxable. Savings bonds are taxable at the federal level, but not at the state level. Of course, there's always an exception in tax. We could spend a whole webinar talking about exceptions. One of them with regard to interest is as long as you're using the saving bond interest income for education expenses, it wouldn't be taxable. But for interest income, what I want you to remember is it's mostly taxable and you'll get a statement from the person who's paying the interest income to you at the end of the year. Line three is dividends. If you get dividends for an investment that you have, you bought a share of Apple stock, let's say one share of Apple stock at the end of the year, Apple said, I'm gonna pay all of our shareholders dividends. Everyone who has one share of stock will receive some dividend income from us. Well, if you did receive dividend, in dividend income, you'll receive a statement at the end of the year. And that statement will say how much you earned in dividend income. Now, I'm gonna go back to 1040 Lines two and three, what we just talked about, is where you would put any interest and any dividends that you received for the year. Now notice box 2A is exempt interest income. So I mentioned municipal interest income. If by chance you received some interest that was not taxable, the IRS just wants to know about it. So it's not taxable. They just like to keep track of individuals who are receiving interest income that's not taxable. So that's the first three lines of page one, wages, interest, dividends, fairly straightforward. The next three, again, pertain mostly to older individuals, though younger individuals could find themselves with one of these sorts of distributions throughout the year. You could have a distribution from your IRA, your individual retirement account. Maybe you received a distribution from your pension or you received social security payments throughout the year. All three of those items have their own special place on 1040 page one. Not every single dollar you receive from either of from any one of those distributions, not every single dollar might be taxable. Some might actually be not taxable. And that's important to know because when we look at 1040 page one, there's a reason why for lines four, five and six for IRA distributions, for pensions and social security, there's a box off to the left. And then right next to it, we have the taxable amount. So for example, on line five, you worked for a company for many years throughout the year. Now that you're retired throughout the year, they send you pension payments. Not all of your pension is taxable. It's most likely that while you work there, you paid some of your own money in so that when you get your pension payments throughout the year, a portion of the money you're receiving 
is actually some of your money you sent in while you were working. Well, because of that, not every dollar you receive is taxable. So maybe you did receive $12,000 in pension payments for the year. You put that on line 5A, but you're only required to pay tax maybe on 9,000 of them. That would go on line 5B. When you get your statement at the end of the year with regard to your distributions and your pensions, you'll see usually the amounts that are taxable or non-taxable. And then last but not least here on line seven, capital gains and losses. Think of this as stock sales. Now I'm finding this is becoming very, very common because it's easy for all of us to get online and buy stocks from companies at any time during the day. So I'm finding more and more people are buying stocks and selling stocks. Now when it comes to tax preparation, we only need to worry about gains or losses when you sell a stock. So if I buy a stock for $100 and it increases in value in one to 120, if I don't sell it, I have nothing to show in my tax return. If I buy it at 100 and it increases to 120 and I sell it at 120, I have to show a $20 gain on my tax return. Any gains that you have during the course of the year with regard to, with regard to stock sales, you have to pay tax on. And that has, a, has its own line right here on 1040 page one. Now, there's one small caveat. Any losses for the year are capped at 3,000. So let's say you did a lot of buying and selling during the course of the year. And you didn't have such a great year with regard to your stock transactions. And when you smashed all your gains and losses together, you realize, oh man, I got a $10,000 loss for the year. You can only deduct 3,000 of it. The rest you carry forward to future years. So on line seven, any stock gains that you have, the IRS wants to know all about it. So any gains and losses for the year, we can smash them together. If what's left over is a gain, you gotta put the whole amount on line seven. If what's left over is a loss, we can only deduct up to 3,000. The rest we have to carry over to future years. Okay? So that's line one through, one through seven. We're almost two thirds of the way through page one of a 1040. And we're only worrying about items that pertain to your tax situation. Again, you might not have all seven of these items. Well, when we look at 1040, we get down to line eight. In line eight, I've got an arrow here. And we're being told on line eight, that's other income and it's schedule one. We've got a whole separate sheet of paper, separate sheet of paper where we're going to have income adjustments that are increases and then income adjustments that are decreases. And a schedule one is what it's called. And I'm gonna show you some of the most common schedule one items. Again, not all of these may pertain to you. So if you get a refund from the state after filing a state tax return, if you itemize that amount is going to be taxable for you, that would be an example of a schedule one item. Alimony, if you received alimony income during the course of the year, this is prior to a divorce prior to 2019, that would be considered taxable. Important side note for divorces 2019 and after, alimony is no longer taxable when received. It's no longer a deduction when it's paid. So I put that in the parentheses just as a reminder. Some other things you might have as additions to your income. These are items that we would add to your lines one through seven. You might have a sole proprietorship that you are running. And one of the sole proprietorships I'm finding that is extremely common now is if you drive for Uber or Lyft. If you drive for Uber or Lyft, you need to complete a Schedule C. It's fairly straightforward. We're not going to do one today. I don't have time for us to get through it, but I can tell you, it's basically just how much did you earn? What are your expenses? What's left over? You have to pay tax on. That's all that it is. And you would put that on a Schedule C. Schedule one on the addition side, you might also have some rental real estate. Maybe you have a K-1 that you receive from an S-Corp or a partnership that you're part owner of. You might have something on schedule one with regard to unemployment compensation. And yes, it is taxable. I know that seems almost unfair to be unemployed, to receive dollars and then to pay tax on it. But I'm just the messenger here. Those dollars you receive with regard to any unemployment compensation is taxable. You should receive a statement at the end of the year. Very often there is federal withholding taken out of the unemployment compensation as you're receiving it during the year. So that's something you would also want to put into your tax software when you're completing it. And one other item, gambling income. So there's a line at the bottom 
of the first part of schedule one, I'll show you in a second. For other items, a good example of that would be gambling income. Yes, gambling income is taxable. I'll talk more about that towards the end, but I just wanted to give you a general idea of when you're looking at a schedule one, I'm gonna show you the form right now. The top portion of this form, some of the most common items were the ones we just walked through. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, I just look at 1040, page one, page two, I've got this other schedule. Remember, we're only paying attention to the lines that pertain to you. So I walked through some items here. Let's say for 2020, you had some unemployment compensation. Maybe you had some other income with regard to some gambling winnings. If those are the only two items you had on schedule one in the additional income section, we would add those amounts together and we would carry the total back to 1040 page one. Now, if you were unsure where to carry it, the IRS forms can seem overwhelming with regard to the number of lines and the amount of information, but they do a really good job of telling you where to go with the number. So for example, combine lines one through eight, enter it here and then, oh, they're telling us to take it to line eight, 1040 page one. So that means lines one through seven in line eight is basically a bunch of income items like wages, interest, dividends, retirement distributions, maybe some stock gains that you had for the year, and then maybe something like unemployment compensation, maybe some gambling winnings, anything that pertains to your situation for the year, you're just going to add them all up and we're gonna arrive at a number on line nine. We're two thirds of the way through page one of a 1040. And all we really did was organize our tax information for the year. Down at the bottom, I've got one of my favorite quotes. It comes from a movie. Everything has its place and there's a place for everything. That's really what accounting is, specifically tax. It's more about organization. It's not really math. There's a little bit of addition, a little bit of subtraction, but for the most part, it's about taking information and organizing it where it needs to go. Your income items, maybe some additional income items. In the bottom of schedule one, we're gonna talk about some things that are deductions. Now, some of the most common things that you might have as a deduction on bottom, the bottom of schedule one could be educator expenses. If you are an educator K through 12, maybe you make contributions to a health savings account. Maybe you paid some alimony for a divorce that was prior to 2019. And then I've got two highlighted there, IRA deductions. This is you making a contribution to your IRA or student loan interest. I'm sure we have many students on the line today. So if you paid some student loan interest for the year, we would have that as a deduction. So this screen, as a reminder, these are additional income items. These income items could be some additions. These items could be some deductions. All of these items are gonna go on schedule one. The top portion for the most part are gonna be our positives, our increases, the bottoms would be decreases. And here again, the same way we subtotaled the top of schedule one, we're gonna add everything together in the bottom of schedule one and take that one number and go back to 1040 page one, put it right here on line 10A. So now line one through nine are all of my income items. On line nine, I have a total amount. If I subtract my subtractions that we just totaled on the bottom of schedule one, after putting it right here, we would arrive at one of the most important numbers on the tax return, adjusted gross income, line 11. And we get there by adding up income items, subtracting any adjustments that we just talked about in schedule one, and we get to your adjusted gross income. This number, sometimes just referred to as AGI, is very often used outside of the world of tax. So you'll be applying for something and there'll be a question on the form saying, what was your AGI for the last two years? This is what they're referring to. You actually wanna to go to your tax form and you can find a line that says AGI. Now that we're at the AGI number, we've gotta do just one more important thing pertaining to two different topics here. Standard deduction, or itemized deduction. Now, all of us get to choose the thing that's best for us. You can use your standard deduction or you can choose your itemized deductions. You wanna choose the largest number. We want the largest number 
the largest number would make our taxable income smaller. We're not doing anything illegal. We're just following tax laws. You have the option to choose between these two things. You wanna choose the number that's best for you, the larger of the two. Now let's say for a second, you don't know what itemized deductions are or you don't have any of them, no problem. The IRS says based on your filing status, you get to choose a standard deduction that matches your filing status. So I'll go back to the married filing jointly I used earlier. If your filing status was married filing jointly, 24,800 is your standard deduction, which means when you're looking at your tax form and you enter that amount on line 12, we're gonna subtract it from your adjusted gross income to get to our taxable income. So what's ever on your adjusted gross income line, we get to subtract from that number the standard or the itemized deduction. We just talked about the standard. We arrive at the taxable income number. And you can imagine the taxable income number is really important. That's the one that's gonna determine your income tax for the year. Now for the standard deductions, look at your filing status. You get to choose one of these. Quick note though, based on your filing status, of course, if you are a senior citizen or you are blind, you actually can increase your standard deduction. So if you were a single person and you were a senior citizen, you actually get a little bit larger of a standard deduction. All software packages that are online will pick that up based off of date of birth. So once you enter your filing status, if the system realizes you're also a senior citizen or you're blind, you would get an additional standard deduction. And again, the larger the deduction, the smaller your taxable income. And that's what we're looking for. Now let's talk about itemized deductions. Itemized deductions appear on Schedule A. If you're thinking, well, wait a minute, itemized deductions, isn't that what most people use? Actually, I got this information right from the IRS. About 87% of taxpayers file a tax return using a standard deduction. Seems like a staggering number, doesn't it? because many of you yourselves or people you know might use a itemized deduction, you file a Schedule A, but 87% of taxpayers use the standard deduction. Now, part of the reason that number is so high now because a few years back when they changed the tax laws, they increased the standard deduction amounts so large that many taxpayers are finding that's the better option for me. So I'm gonna go with my standard deduction. Now, the specific itemized deductions, the big ones, the big three that I call it, if you will, is mortgage interest, real estate taxes, and charitable contributions. Okay? So mortgage interest, you have a loan for your home, your townhome, your condo. At the end of the year, you'll get a mortgage statement. It will indicate the amount of mortgage insurance you paid for the year. That's one item that we could use for our Schedule A. Gifts that you gave to a church, gifts you gave to charitable organizations, you get a statement at the end of the year, you can put that on your Schedule A. And then the taxes section. So the taxes section, you can quickly find yourself at $10,000, especially here in the state of Illinois. We have very high real estate taxes. And if you're working, we also have high state withholding, our state taxes and our real estate taxes can quickly get you to 10,000. So what's so magical about that number? When they made changes to the tax laws a few years back, they capped that section at 10,000. So let's say you're married filing jointly, you and your spouse both work, you have state withholding being taken out of your paycheck. You also pay some real estate taxes. You quickly are at 10,000. It's capped at 10,000. You lose any deduction dollars above that amount. They've been talking about changing that. I'm not sure if they will, but as of right now, that's the law. So this is one of the reasons why with the tax law changes, people are finding themselves utilizing the standard because even with $10,000 in a tax section, let's say you're capped at it, you add some mortgage interest, maybe you add seven or 8,000, add seven or 8,000 to some charitable contribution. It could be that the standard deduction could still be better for you if you had 24,000 in itemized deductions and 24,800 was your standard deduction. And then one other thing on Schedule A here, maybe two other things, Medical expenses on Schedule A, you can only deduct them for medical expenses above 7.5% of your AGI. What does that mean? You think back to our 1040 page one, it told you that AGI number was a really important number. Here's an example of that. We can only take medical expenses as a deduction on our Schedule A if they exceed 7.5% of our AGI. 
So let's say for the sake of conversation, your AGI was $100,000. 7.5% of that would be $7,500. You would need more than 7,500 of medical expenses to be able to deduct the amount above 7,500 on your Schedule A. So if you had $8,000 in medical expenses and the threshold for you was 7,500, you'd only be able to deduct $500 of medical expenses, okay? Here's the Schedule A. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Schedule A stands for the grade you would get if I asked you to complete it, because it's really easy. You're just gonna drop the amounts in for the topics we just talked about if they pertain to you. You have some mortgage interest, if you had real estate taxes, if you had charitable contributions. And then up here is the medical expenses that I talked about. And again, we're totaling all these up and taking one number and carrying it someplace else. So the forms that I'm showing you today, 1040 page one and page two, schedule one and schedule A, all of those forms flow really well together. I know I'm sounding like a nerd here, but I am a nerd, I will admit to that. But these forms can be overwhelming with the amount of boxes, the amount of lines, the amount of spaces. But very often, we're just using this form as a way to add up all of our items. And then we take that one item and we carry it someplace. If we find the amount of our itemized deductions is larger than our standard, we'll carry this over to 1040 page one. And we'll put that amount on line 12. If the standard is larger, we're going to stick with the standard. Okay. After we find standard itemized, I said we were going to subtract it from the adjusted gross income and we arrive at taxable income. Now, it's fantastic that taxable income is the last number of page one because it's a really important number. If you need to find it, you can go to page one, go right down to the bottom. So that's our taxable income. That's what we're going to use to calculate our tax. We're going to do a tax calculation here. Then we're going to jump over to 1040 page two, which actually is pretty easy because really 1040 page two is nothing more than this. We're gonna show the IRS the tax we're responsible for. We're gonna show the IRS what we've paid in. And then we'll be able to show that either we're getting a refund or we need to cut a check to the IRS, okay? So this is the fourth thing that I wanted to cover today, calculating your tax liability. Now there is some math on here, but you can do this, stay with me. We'll do it in two parts here. The first part is, let's assume we have a person who's head of household and this person for head of household filing status has taxable income of 35,950. That's the taxable income. Now, remember, we just walked through 1040 page one. We all now know that taxable income of 35,950 does not mean that's what that person earned for the year at their job. They might have had some wages, some interest, some dividends. Then they had some adjustments. And then they subtracted their standard or their itemized. Then they arrived at taxable income. So your taxable income is not the amount of money you earned for the year. Okay? And because this person's filing head of household, they're filing head of household because they're a single taxpayer. They have a dependent child. And I made this situation for someone who has a dependent child who's under the age of 16, 16 and under. Why is that important? You get a $2,000 child tax credit. We're gonna find here that when we look at the tax rate table for a person who's head of household and has taxable income, it falls within this range here, specifically taxable income of 35,950. Their tax amount turns out to be $4,032, but we get to reduce that amount by a full $2,000 because of the child tax credit. So now on the tax form, we're only going to show our responsibility for the year with regard to the tax liability, $2,032. Now specifically, this is how we do the calculation. And we do this in class. Sometimes it takes students a couple of times to get it, but this is all there is to it. And it works the same way, regardless of your filing status or regardless of where your taxable income falls. You would just go down to a different line if you had a larger taxable income amount. So again, 35,950, that's the taxpayer's taxable income. I find that that number falls in between these two numbers here. Not exactly, but it falls within that range. And the way the tax rate table works, works like this. That means the tax on those dollars 
is $1,410 plus 12% of the amount over $14,100. Now what that means is every taxable income dollar above $14,100 all the way up to $35,950 is gonna be taxed at 12%. So the first $14,100 for this tax payer was taxed at 10%. Then the taxpayer jumps up to the next tax rate. The next tax rate is 12%, which means the next dollars that the taxpayer has in taxable income, those dollars are taxed at 12%. Now, I want you to understand that because very often taxpayers think, oh, I pay this rate in taxes. Well, technically, if you were to put all of your taxable income dollars, one that were right next to each other, one chunk of it is taxed at one rate. The next chunk of it is taxed at a different rate. And as you keep adding taxable income dollars to all those dollars you've got lined up, the tax rates get larger and larger and larger. We have a progressive tax rate system here in the United States. Your taxable income increases, you pay more in taxes. Okay? So if I take 35,950 and I subtract 14,100, because I want to find out what that amount is there, that amount would be, and I don't have it on the screen, 21,850. And I know that because 35,950 minus 14,100, 21,850. So if you took 21,850 and you multiplied it by 12%, you get $2,622. So that person's tax on taxable income of 35,950 for head of household is $1,410 plus the calculation we just did, 12% of any dollars above 14.1, which is the 26.22. We add them together, $4,032. That's the taxpayer's tax on that taxable income. But we get to reduce that amount by a full $2,000 because the taxpayer in this situation has a child tax credit of 2,000. So they're only truly responsible for, for the year, $2,032. Now that was the mathiest part of our conversation today, the most math that we'll talk about. But really, when we look at 1040 page two, there's only three spots I really need to drop the numbers in. I'm skipping over a few subtotals. We don't need them for the sake of our conversation. 4,032, I'm gonna drop that on line 16. That's the tax I'm responsible for for the year based on my taxable income. I subtract $2,000 for my child tax credit. So I put on my tax return, $2,000. And then I find line 24, my total tax responsibility for the year turns out to be $2,032. And you might be thinking, okay, well, well, that's my tax for the year. So, so now what, how do I know how much money I'm going to get back? Well, we need to do one last step here. All we're gonna do is compare what we're responsible for for the year with what we actually paid in. Most of us have our wages when they're paid throughout the course of the year. The withholding is taken out at that time. So your employer is taking out taxes and sending it into the IRS. That would be box two of your W-2 if you happen to be looking at it. So if this taxpayer has already paid in $5,000 to the IRS during the course of the year, they were only responsible for 2,000 that means they're going to get almost a $3,000 refund, $29.68. Because we put in any income items pertaining to this taxpayer, we made any adjustments pertaining to this taxpayer, we chose standard or itemized based on this taxpayer, we got the taxable income for this taxpayer, calculated the tax, determined the refund amount. Those five steps are the same for all of us, everyone on the line today, and everyone is not on the line today. If you're completing at 1040 page one and page two, the same process applies to all of us. There's nothing magical about it. I often joke with my students, I have no superhuman powers. I truly don't. All I've done was take some tax information. I've organized it where it needed to go. And I let kind of the process take care of the rest. Now, again, for those of you looking at this saying, I usually do it in the software. I don't need to do any of these calculations. We don't just want to know how, how, we don't just want to know how something is done. We also want to know why. Why are those numbers coming out like that? I've had to sit with taxpayers before and, and explain, you're telling me I owe $18,000 in taxes? Well, 
let's take a look. Let's take a look at your income. Let's take a look at your deductions. Take a look at how much you paid in and let's, let's figure out why that's the case. Those are much more challenging conversations. Obviously, it's really easy to walk out and tell someone, congratulations, you're getting a $3,000 refund. But there's nothing magical on my part that I'm doing. A few more things here. So some common misunderstandings with regard to the world of tax. And I hear this one quite a bit. Well, working overtime means I pay extra in taxes. Well, let's think about that for a second. Let's say we had three individuals here. And for the sake of the conversation, we'll make it real easy. All three individuals, single. All three individuals, no dependents. So we've just got a single person for tax purposes. The first person has a job and they make $60,000 as a salary. Same amount every week they get from their employer. The second person has a $40,000 a year job, but during the course of the year, they work some overtime, $20,000 worth of overtime during the course of the year. The third person has two jobs. Each job pays $30,000 for a total of 60. Now, all things being equal, again, same filing status, same number of dependents, in this case, zero. Let's say they're all using the standard deduction. The taxable income would be the same if, again, all things were equal. You don't pay more in taxes at the end of the year because a large portion of your pay came from overtime. You don't pay more in taxes at the end of the year because you work two jobs or three jobs. It's all based on that taxable income number. And then whatever tax rate table we're gonna utilize for the scenario that pertains to that individual taxpayer. Now, a couple of small caveats here. If by chance you work for an employer, and let's say you get a big bonus twice a year, June 30th, December 31st, you get a big bonus, $10,000 each time. If the HR person, if the payroll person doesn't adjust that payroll for being a special one-time payment, for being a bonus payment, the payroll system thinks, oh my goodness, this person is getting a $10,000 check this week. Well, there's 52 weeks in a year. This person must be making $520,000. So that's why the taxes seem so high in that situation, because the payroll system is just looking at numbers. It doesn't realize, no, 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 the taxpayer is just getting a big bonus. Here again, you can ask your HR person, you can ask your payroll person, if you're getting a big bonus, hey, please do me a favor, please make sure you adjust that for a bonus payment, a special one-time payment. You don't want too much in taxes taken out. Now on the flip side of that, here's what happens when people work two smaller jobs. Your employer pays you, the payroll software thinks, okay, this person's gonna make 30,000 for the year. The payroll system doesn't know you're working another job. Now you file your tax return and you find, oh my goodness, my taxable income is much higher because of these two jobs. But both, both of my employers did not take out enough. You could be under withheld in that situation. But just to be clear, being over withheld or under withheld does not mean you pay more in taxes, okay? If you paid too much at the end of the year, you're going to get the amount back. We just did the calculation. If this taxpayer only paid in $1,000 in this scenario, this taxpayer would owe a little over $1,000 to the IRS. So your tax liability, what you're responsible for the year, that number is what it is. And we just compare it to what you paid in for the year. A couple more here. My account deducts everything. My account always gets me a big refund. Well, I just admitted a second ago that I have no superhuman powers which means all I'm doing is following the process with regard to tax preparation. So if you took your tax return to your accountant, who you may love, and again, I'm not asking you to change your account, that accountant does everything correct, that refund amount or the amount that you have due should be the same amount that you get if you went to 10 different preparers. The data is the same, the results should be the same. Again, great people in the world of tax, they have a passion for tax, they want to help people. They enjoy this stuff. But the reality is, if one of my taxpayers said, I'm moving, I'm going to find an account in another state, no problem. Find someone else fantastic. And I assure you, they're going to get the same results that you would get had you stayed with me. And then this one here, this actually came up over the last two weeks. A, a neighbor of mine reached out to me and asked about this, about gambling winnings. One of the most common misunderstandings with regard to gambling winnings is this. Well, I won $5,000 gambling but I lost 4,000. So I only have to show 1,000 on my tax return. That is not 
not the case. Your gambling winnings and your gambling losses are two separate conversations, okay? Your gambling winnings are going to go on schedule one. You're gonna show the IRS, I struck it big at the boat. I won 10 grand. You've gotta put all $10,000 as income on your schedule one. Then your losses, you can put on your schedule A, but you can only put them on there up to the amount of your winnings. So if you won 10,000, but you lost 20,000 for the year, you can only use $10,000 in losses. If you won $10,000 for the year and you only spent five bucks, fantastic. You can put the $5 on there, but it's probably not gonna be that big of an advantage for you, but you're probably pretty happy that you have that big win for the year, pretty exciting, okay? 251, so let me talk about just a couple other topics here with regard to some things I thought I could talk about if we had an opportunity to. So here's a few of them. We talked about the child tax credits being worth $2,000, other dependent credits worth $500, education credits. So I'm sure there are many students on the line today for education credits, you could be eligible for an education credit up to $2,500 for the American Opportunity Credit or $2,000 for the lifetime learning credit. The easiest way to keep those two separate Think of the American Opportunity Credit as like an undergrad credit. Think of lifetime learning for credits for everything after that point in time. Okay? The American Opportunity is a little bit larger of a credit. It's a little bit easier to get the full credit amount, in this case, $2,500. The lifetime learning, if that one applies to you, let's say you're going to grad school, you could get a credit of up to $2,000 if you had $10,000 in expenses. And then last but not least here, I think I'll mention this with regard to the recovery rebate credit. A lot of questions with regard to this. Basically, it works like this. During the course of 2020, there were some stimulus payments that were sent. There were some stimulus payments at the beginning part of 2020, then there were some towards the end. If you received both of them, when you complete your tax return in the software of your choosing, you'll put the amount that you received for both stimulus payments. It will not impact your tax return. If by chance you did not receive one or both of those stimulus payments, you will put that in the system. You will mark that I did not receive either one or I did not receive both of my payments. You'll receive those dollars as credit on your tax return, okay? So just to be clear, think back to 2020, those stimulus payments. Now for most of us, the first one came through in about the first third of the year. The second one came right at the end of 2020. In fact, for some taxpayers, it jumped over into 2021. If you receive both of them, put that in your software. If you receive neither of them, mark that in your software. You will get that as a credit on this year's tax return, which means your refund amount would be larger if you're getting a refund, okay? For all these items that I just mentioned here, I've got in red, anywhere I see red here, phase out supply. And really what that means is once you get to, I'm gonna use air quotes, to rich for tax purposes, air quotes, whatever that rich number is, it's different for all of us based on our filing status. Some of these credits won't apply for you because you're considered as having too much income for tax purposes. So you're not eligible to receive some of these credits. But the nice thing about the software, you don't need to do all the calculations in your head. You need to know what information you need to use for tax purposes you enter it into the software correctly. And the software will do the threshold calculations based off of the income that you've entered. Similar to the deduction we did on Schedule A for the medical expenses, the system would automatically calculate 7.5% of your AGI. The system will automatically determine if your income level is too high for any one of these education credits. And one other thing here, again, I could talk about tax for hours and hours and hours, but this is an hour long seminar here. Schedule C, I mentioned earlier that many individuals are now driving for Uber and Lyft. You're self-employed. I want to remind you in case you're not aware, when you have profits from your Schedule C activities, so Schedule C is nothing more than how much did you earn, any expenses that you had, what's left over is profit, any of those dollars that you earn, your profit that you earn on your Schedule C are ultimately gonna be taxable at the federal level and they're ultimately going to be taxable for self-employment tax. 
which is 15.3%. So I just want to remind you, as you are earning money throughout the course of the year for driving from Uber or Lyft or other activities that are considered a sole proprietorship, please be sure you're putting money aside to pay for taxes at the end of the year, or you could be making estimated payments to the IRS during the course of the year. I'd encourage you to do either one or maybe even both. You don't wanna find yourself at the end of the year in a situation where you just have a tremendous tax liability due. And before we go here, if you are researching tax questions, please use reputable sources. I'd encourage you to use first and foremost, irs.gov. So irs.gov has a tremendous amount of information, but believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, believe it or not, it's really well put together. It's actually really easy to read. So I gave you the example about the gambling winnings that a neighbor had a question for, was actually able just to send a link over and the neighbor was able to see, oh, right off the IRS website, any winnings are taxable. My losses can be deductions on schedule A up to the amount of my winnings. So I'd encourage you when you have questions, you can go to irs.gov, do just a quick search there. And it really is well-written responses to some of the most common questions we have in the world of tax. Also, since I have you here, I want to remind you that accounting is a career. So in the world of accounting, there's really three big areas. There's tax, there's audit, and there's advisory. Advisory is just pretty much everything that's not audit or tax. If you think tax might be interesting for you as a career, or maybe just accounting in general, I'd encourage you to take some classes. Oh, it looks like someone does not think that that's the case. I'd encourage you to take some classes here at your local university or Roosevelt University and consider that as a career because when you graduate with an accounting degree, there are accounting firms ready to hire people. There are tax firms ready to hire people. Very often in high school, we spend a lot of time talking about STEM. Well, if it was up to me, we'd put an A in STEM and make it STEAM because I think we need to talk about accounting a little bit more. Accounting's not going away. Public accounting firms are getting larger and larger and larger. Most of the companies that you've worked for, you might be working now at, you work in an accounting department. So public accounting are the firms that prepare tax returns and prepare audits for individuals from all sorts of companies. Private accounting is when you work in an accounting department for one specific company. And then last but not least here, if you want some free tax preparation, there's a service called VITA. You can Google it and get more information, but I'll give you a quick summary. VITA is a free tax preparation service through the IRS. And again, the red lines on the screen was somebody writing on it. It was not me, so I wasn't drawing a frowny face there. I'm not sure what that is, but there is a service called VITA, it's Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. It's a nationwide service. Now this year due to COVID, there are not as many sites that are open, but we happen to have one open at Roosevelt University this year, 425 South Wabash on Wednesdays from one to five. Our service is free for taxpayers when they come in. The procedures this year are a little bit different. Again, due to COVID, we're asking taxpayers to, of course, wear a mask, to socially distance. You'll be asked to drop off your tax information after completing some documents and come back the following week or two to pick up your tax return. In years past, usually we would prepare your return as you wait, but we are trying to limit the number of people in the building at any one time. Again, this is a nationwide service. So if you happen to be online in another state, you can find a VITA site locator at irs.gov and you can find a site that is near you. You can also visit AARP, AARP. Yes, though that, that, that company does individual tax preparation for free. They usually tend to focus more on senior citizens whereas VITA takes individuals from, from all ages. Some VITA sites have wage restrictions to where after you make a certain amount of money, you're not eligible for free tax service. We do not have a wage restriction at our site. We can take any dollar amount with regard to wages. There are some things we can't do. We can't do rental property. We can't do really, really complex schedule C's that have hundreds of thousands of dollars only because that's not what we're allowed to do per our partnership with the IRS. And if you're thinking, well, I don't need to do, I don't need to get my tax return prepared for free. I do my own. If you feel comfortable with tax and maybe you don't want to do it as a career, please consider volunteering at a VITA site. So you might volunteer at your local church, your local food pantry, 
this is another way for you to volunteer and give back. And if you're thinking, well, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax professional, there's not much I can do. We can always use an extra set of hands at a VITA site. It could be greeting taxpayers, it could just be organizing documents, it could just be making copies, but reach out to a VITA site near you and see if they need some help. Again, there's not as many sites open this year. It's a great way to give back and it's something you can add to your resume. So thank you again for attending today. And let me look through some of the questions. There are, as the questions were coming through, I realized that there was no way I was gonna keep up with them as they were coming through. So let me see if I can go through a few of them here. Senior citizen, we're considering a senior citizen is someone who's 65 years and older. That's what's considered a senior citizen. But we know for 65 year olds nowadays, 65 is the new 40, right? So I don't know why they gotta get rid of the word senior citizen. So the question was, what's AGI, adjusted gross income? Thank you for that. Other question here, do medical deductions include any medical insurance premiums? They absolutely do. So if you pay insurance during the course of the year, you can also throw that on there. Yes, so Jean asked the question with regard to the $300. So for this year, if you choose to use the standard deduction and you did have some charitable contributions, there is a spot on 1040 page one for you to put that charitable contribution. It's line 10B. So Jean is asking the question, she's using a standard deduction. She made a charitable contribution, $300 or more. She can put up to $300 here. So if you gave $200 as a charitable contribution, we would put $200 there. But if by chance you gave 500, you would be maxed at $300. So this is a nice change. It'll give you a little bit extra of a refund. So let's think about it. If you're in the 15% tax bracket, a $300 deduction would give you an extra $45. So that's kind of nice. Let me go through a few of these or some of these are duplicates. Someone was asking the question with regard to gambling winnings worth versus investment in stocks. I'm laughing there, um, Slater, that you asked that because that's a great question because many would argue that investing is much like gambling. So when you invest in stocks, it really is just a form of gambling because you really have no idea what's going to happen. But you'd like to think if you do your due diligence and you're investing in a reputable company, you got a pretty good idea what's going to happen. But yes, your profits, your gains from stock sales that you have from the course of the year are going to go on line seven. You strike it big at the boat one night and you win a huge chunk of money. That's going to go on schedule one here as other income. So I got a couple questions with regard to the stimulus payments and how those works. The software that you are utilizing for the most, most part should be taking your stimulus payments. And if your system sees that you've made two, that you have received two stimulus payments, you would not get an additional credit. But if by chance you've only received one for the year, or maybe you, you did not receive either one, on line 30, 1040 page two, you'll get that extra amount. So if you receive both payments, you're not getting any more. If by chance you only received one or didn't receive either one of them, then you'd have the opportunity to get it when you file a tax return. And a quick side note, for those of you who don't know, usually file a tax return, there's no reason for you to because your income is so low. If you didn't receive one or both payments, you could do that and receive that recovery rebate credit. That's what they're calling it now. So that is a little bit confusing. We've got stimulus payment one, stimulus payment two, and then suddenly they're calling it on the tax return, anything you didn't receive, they're calling it a recovery rebate credit. Yeah. Would Schedule C needed to be for tutoring? Slater, good question. Probably depends on the dollar amount. If you're tutoring for a business and you've got a lot of tutoring action going on, you've got a lot of income, maybe you've got some expenses, you're kind of in the business of tutoring. A couple times a year, you do some tutoring, maybe it's a couple hundred dollars. I'd probably just throw that on schedule one, okay? just some other income. As far as recommending a certain software, there's so many on the market, I, I would wanna say any specific one, but just find one that you have found that friends or family feel that's reputable, one that is really popular. Again, I don't wanna mention any single one because then it'll seem like I'm discounting other ones. So. 
couple of people are saying they volunteered for Vita and they really enjoyed it. And I, I like that steam is picking up. So keep that steam going. A is for, oh, A is for art. Okay, well then we need two A's in there. We need steam, we need one more A in there. Eugene is telling us ARP is not open due to COVID. Yes, depending on the sites, some sites are not open due to COVID. Some sites, some sites are strictly virtual in that they're asking taxpayers to give documents all virtually. So there is no face-to-face -face contact. For those of you who just can't find a place, again, you can come to our site. We'd be happy to prepare your tax return. And our tax service is running from now through April 7th. So Wednesday, April 7th, we'll be preparing taxes in the office there. Vita does not help with the PPP application. So Deanne was asking that. Looks like I have some former students in there. It's great to see so many of you. Oh my gosh, bringing back memories. So the unemployment compensation, you should receive a statement from the Illinois Department of Employment Securities. If not, just reach out to them. So if you received unemployment payments throughout the course of the year, at the end of the year, you should receive a statement from them. If not, just contact them and they can either send you a duplicate or they can point you in a direction online to get the form, which is usually gonna be much faster. So Danielle, you're asking, my paper application never matches the online application. Could be small rounding. It could be some of the income items that you have are special. It's 307, let me tell you this. We've got a few more minutes here. So here's what could be happening in Danielle's situation. Qualified dividends, and this is a little far off the scope of what we wanted to talk about today, but since we have a few minutes, qualified dividends and long-term capital gains, which means gains from sales of stock that you've held for more than one year, those are considered special items in the world of tax. And because they're a special item, they get a special tax rate, which is a little bit lower. So it could possibly be, Danielle, that some of the items in your paper compilation calculation that you're doing are might not might not be taxed at the same rate as all of your other items. That's kind of what I can guess here from what you're what you're asking. So Renee asked the question, did I understand correctly that you do not have to include any refund you got from the state unless you itemize? That is correct. So if you live in the state of Illinois and you got a refund from the state of Illinois, you do not have to show that refund amount as income on schedule one unless you itemized in the prior year. Great question. And Ruby, what's nice about the standard deduction, there's nothing for us to figure out here. The only thing you need to do to determine your standard deduction is to look to see what your filing status is. So Ruby, let's just say you're single for tax purposes, your standard deduction is 12,400. Nothing else to determine unless you happen to be a senior citizen, 65 and older, and or you're blind. In that case, your standard deduction gets a little bit larger, okay? The standard deduction is based off of filing status. Yeah, Rashawn, we asked a good question. Is there a limit for charity for donation for tax purposes? There is. That gets into a threshold conversation. I will tell you, if you give a lot, a lot of money to charities, you give 30, 40, 50, 60% of your AGI to charities. At some point, those contributions are capped. So please keep that in mind. That falls out of the scope of our conversation today, but for higher income individuals, yes, there is a threshold you could meet. Free tax USA still available through the IRS? I believe so, you can check that, you can check that. Ruby also asks $500 for dependents. So anyone who's not 16 and under, Ruby is going to be the other dependent. So on 1040 page one, You've got four dependents listed, three are age 16 and younger. Those three, we get a child tax credit of 2,000 each. The fourth person on your return happens to be someone who's 20 years old. In that situation, that would be an other dependent, $500. Judy's asking a question with regards to the payments for the year. So for, for in that situation, Judy, complete your tax return. And when you complete the tax return, only put in the amount of the payments that you received. And yes, those extra dollars that you didn't receive for the kids you should receive when you file your tax return. 
Question, where are we located? 425 South Wabash, Wednesdays one through five. When you come in, security will be there. They will ask you, of course, to be masked. They will, of course, ask you to, to maintain social distance. Uh, there is a security check in there. If we get really crowded, they will limit the number of people. So we're following all COVID pro protocols with regard to the office flow there. Just a couple more minutes. We see we can go on and on all day today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the, the compliments I'm getting here. Slater, another good question. Slater, I think you need to go into tax, buddy. So if you live in Illinois, but go to school in Massachusetts, can you confirm that you need to file for both? So actually when you live in a state, so let's say Slater, you live here in Illinois with mom and dad, but you can just go to school in Massachusetts. Really for tax purposes, you're here. Mom and dad are gonna claim you, you're gonna be on the tax return. You don't have to file a tax return in MA unless you earn some wages out there. So if you got a part-time job, you'll have to do that then, but that's no big deal. Uh, Jarlene asks, what's the minimum deduction for the contributions? I'm assuming you mean here, there actually is no minimum. So if you use the standard deduction and you give $50 to your church at the end of the year for 2020, you could put $50 on a tax return. Absolutely. All right, I got to the end. And the last thing was a thank you and more thank yous. Okay. So I yes. think that just about does it there today. Thank you so much, Dr. Nutson, for preparing this amazing presentation. It was extremely helpful. Um, thank you for staying over and answering all of the questions. We appreciate um, the, not only this information, just for, for you dedicating your time and just sharing all of this with our community. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who joined us today. Um, you will receive an email by tomorrow with this recording. So you do, you will have it. So if you need to go back, back to it and, and, and check on some of the information that was shared, you will of course, have that to reference. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.